Welcome to Go Sports Live. I'm Matty Marshall. We got a little bit to go before we get to the uh, Windy City Major here, the next big event. And the NXL season is going to be going down September 15th through the 17th. And yeah, two more big ones to go. I'm, I'm pretty uh, pretty stoked about the, you know, we always got to check in with the leading minds in the game. So I'm pretty stoked about the guests that we have today. It's going to be Ryan Brand, coach of San Antonio X Factor, coming off a second place finish at the last event in the most dramatic fashion, went into one-on-ones where Tom Guest lost to Jacob Edwards. But if Tom Guest had pulled out that gunfight, then it would be San Antonio X Factor hoisting that trophy. That's how close it was. And looking forward to uh, to kind of getting in to talk to him about um, what went into that that performance since that second place finish that, again, was as close as it gets. And then also want to discuss with him uh, kind of all the big stories and, you know, kind of there's been a few changes here, there player wise heading into this next one. So let's bring ryan brand in here and just dive right into this conversation because you know we, we check in with ryan on a regular basis also big shout out to project paintball uh releasing some of the most high-end stuff you could possibly get again it's so high-end that if you don't swoop it up typically in the first couple of minutes you ain't getting it um and uh yeah just a big fan not you know they're not even paying me to say this i just love what you guys are doing and i really think that's a super cool thing for paintball because you know every everyone's kind of looking for that high-end custom stuff we're going to be talking a little bit about that as well, too. But, Ryan, let's jump into this a little bit here. I just want to kind of dive right into the deep end right away. Second place at the last event, it came all the way down to that one-on-one. -on -one. That's, I mean, that's, I can't think of a more frustrating way to end a tournament because, as everyone knows, if you get blown out, like whenever you get blown out, when you, if you know, you lose in the quarterfinals or semifinals or wild card, whatever you went, one and three, like there's so many things you had to fix that it's it's like okay this sucks but like we have so much to discuss that it's not that big of a deal when you lose by a really tiny fraction like by the will of the paintball gods in really deep into sunday it's incredibly frustrating um so yeah i just kind of want to ask you about that obviously it's super frustrating but what what was going through your mind you know at, at the tail end of that one-on-one -on -one, other than god damn it yeah um that was definitely i would say the most frustrating loss uh that i probably had and, and we've we've had a few of these uh you know in a world cups finals uh, recently in the past three or four years that you know we we had the game in hand and kind of just lost it at the very end um you know and this one in particular you know we had uh you know up a point going you know the final point um and almost hold, hold them off to to beat them in regulation you know where it actually came down to a one-on-one -on -one for a brief uh, you know, amount of seconds it was a car crash of a point you know, of a uh, a point where bodies were dropping everywhere. But at the end of the point, it was TJ and Jason, the last two people on the field. And if TJ popped his head up to look at the clock, uh, which I believe had maybe 20 seconds or something left on it, but if he would have been able to stay alive, um, then we went it right there in regulation. And uh, and Jason just put the nastiest shot on on TJ when he popped up to look at the clock. And TJ didn't know where Jason was. It was a car crash. It wasn't really much of a one-on-one, -on -one aside from the fact that they were the only two players on the field alive. Uh, and so then we go to overtime. You know, we go up a body early. Um, you know, we get the trade and the snake. Uh, and at that point, we had them trapped. Uh, you know, Rainy was the widest body out in the snake can. And we had two bodies in the snake structure up a body. And to me, from the sidelines, it's curtains. You know, I'm not... I'm not counting my eggs before they hatch or anything, but it's one of those things like we practiced enough points on that field and we played enough points on that field that as soon as that trade happened, the snake would cold bunker keep and Rainy was trapped. I was like, all right, we just won the tournament. Um, and it just damaged it. What they do a good job of is of honkering down in that moment. And, um, you know, they, they ran out the clock, you know, we, you know, again, Jason hit a really ridiculous shot on Billy when Billy just looked over the top, you know, checking something off before he made a move. Um, they evened up the count. We saw the position. Um, Rainey didn't play uh, into our hand, and they just took it to to one on ones. Uh, and that was that was probably the most frustrating thing. It's not you know losing the one on one. It's a one on one, right? Uh, that's frustrating, but it's a one on one us not winning the match in regulation when we should have and not winning it in overtime when we should have, I think that's what made me walk away and kind of shaking my head going, wow, that's, 
that's how we let it, you know, slip from our, from our grip right down there. So are you just basically like, look, guys, we're only going to be doing drills from now on. Uh, we're just going to be doing <laughs> high body situation drills. We're going to pretend it's overtime and uh, we need to not make these mistakes. I mean, but it, look, it, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's very frustrating. I mean, you guys, your roster is super solid. I do. I want to talk man for man down your roster um, because I do feel that even though you guys do have the second place finish and you've been really consistent against, uh, if we go back to the beginning of last season, if we just take the beginning of last season off the board, you guys have been incredibly consistent. And if we take those very, those anomalies away, if we go all the way back years, then you guys continue to be this incredibly consistent team, even taking hitch to your roster, which I would like to discuss too, but but when you do go into that moment and you do lose situations that on paper, it's like, all right, well, this is the situation we control. We have outside contained. We have the numerical superiority. These are, this is a point we absolutely should win, but that's when the gremlins start seeping in. You know I mean? That's when it's, when you're dealing with these very chaotic moments and you have a team like Tampa Bay damage that does excel constantly, no matter what they want to say uh, in these defensive moments. Yeah, sure. They can play offense too. Obviously you're not going to win tournaments if you can't play offense. But they're so good at just playing that defensive, you know, dirty South paintball. What do you like? What type of criticism? Because there's probably a lot of divisional teams and coaches that are listening to this right now. They may be in a similar situation. You know, it's like, okay, well, we we should have won this one. There was multiple times when we could have dropped that coffin nail down and hit it hard. And we just couldn't put it away. We had the guy on the ropes, whatever, you know, cliche you want to use. How do you coach that? I mean, obviously, it's different at your level because you're dealing with these guys that have been there and done that um, and they know when they make a mistake, but how do you deal with that? And then how do you deal with it personally? And then how would you say like a divisional team should be dealing with something like that? I mean, there's two learning. There's two things here in this scenario. Yeah. I mean, well, the learning moment in our particular match, um, I think comes down to um, playing the moment. Uh, I mean, mind you, I think if, if that would have been, the prelims or the quarterfinals or, or even the semifinals that maybe we would have played that point a little bit differently. I think it kind of got in everyone's heads that when we had the superiority and when we had the containment that um, we kind of took our foot off of the gas just for a little bit of like, Oh, this, this is it. We can't make a mistake here. And if we stalled out for just a second there um, and in that stall, it allowed damage to reposition a little bit and cover the zones that needed to be covered. Um, and I think that's a learning moment for us. And I think that is a learning moment for all players is that you got to play paintball points like it's a paintball point, right? You can't, you can't say, Hey, this is for the match. This is for the tournament and play it differently because the scenarios remain consistent. You know, we, we're, I've been having to beat this out of my guy's heads because this is something, you know, uh, a concept that I've had to learn over my, you know, years of doing this, but, you know, it's like, oh, it's Sunday now. We got to play tighter. Well, it's Sunday ball. Everything's going to change. But in reality, it shouldn't change. Like, it <laughs> yeah. shouldn't. It's it's yeah. paintball. Like, the windows are the windows, right? And so, you know, the windows open and the windows close, whether it's for a gunfight or a move or, or really any decision that needs to be taken on the field. And so if you're adjusting that uh by you either saying well we should play slower or we should uh not take that gunfight because it's sunday we shouldn't make that move because it's the finals uh what we need to check things off be extra careful because the stakes might be higher well you're you're messing with that window you know your opponent isn't uh shooting less paint or isn't switching uh back and forth any slower or quicker um, you, it's just, uh, one of those things. So I think for us, sometimes it's, it's kind of getting that over that hump and, you know, I don't want to necessarily call it pressure as much as mindset and you're, you have to fight those, uh, the, in this sport, you know, and, and it probably takes place. I'm, I'm not as, um, I don't know the best way to say it. Like I, I understand traditional sports, but maybe I don't know them A to Z as much as I do in paintball, but you know, it's all about you know, rising to the moment and showing up, you know, for the big game. But for me, I think with paintball, I just, I don't think you can play it differently than it needs to be played. Every gunfight should be played how the gunfight is going to be played. Uh, so in those big moments, you, you just got to play them for what they are. 
that that's kind of my advice. Well, it's interesting because when I talked to, okay, so you, you just went blow for blow with Joey blue and Tampa Bay damage for 15 minutes of regulation, five minutes of overtime and into a one-on-one it got decided in the one-on-one. I mean, that's as close as it gets in our sport other than going to a couple more one-on-ones, which is incredibly rare. Yeah, Damage did it last year uh, in Texas. That seems to be their MO now. I mean, it's paintball fate the way it is. But but it, when you're dealing, you know, he's dealing with a lot of seasoned veterans. So are you. You know, I mean, it, when you look at your roster, I mean, even some of these new additions, these are guys that have played for teams before, these you know, pro teams before. These aren't, you know, we're, we're talking about, I mean, if you're starting your snake side, you got, you know, Billy Bernacci, Colt Roberts, and Meter Ninos essentially kind of doing this the snake side stuff. Um different mixes here or there, obviously, but I mean, they're carrying the lion's share of the weight on that side. I mean, those guys are incredibly experienced, you know, and then obviously, you know, some of your, you know, Cody Mikowski is a newer pickup, John Parrish, um, Jesse Stevens has left, but I mean, you know, TJ Danner, he's been around forever. Cody Bayless is a veteran. You know, you're not dealing with these brand new boot rookie dudes who just got here and need like a stern talking to. So how do you go about obviously doing the X's and the O's, but some coaches are more about the X's and O's and some coaches are more psychologists. Like, how do you kind of fit yourself in there? Because dude, you're one of the best we got, man. I mean, you know, when you look at X factors record uh, record with you at the helm, it's very impressive. So what's the secret sauce there on that, on that kind of X's and O's psychologist side of things from the coaching. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm definitely, uh, I'm mixing the two and I've, I think this year I'm finally having to play a little bit less psychologist than I have in every iteration of me coaching this year for the past, uh, I guess 11 and 12 years or so. Um, just because I, I've, I've got different personalities on the, on the field. And it's now kind of more of a unit moving in one direction and, um, you know, a little bit less of, of, some of these characters that you company, you know, get into that are, they need a little bit more of that, or, or there's uh, more conflict, right? There's uh, be it if it was their fault or someone else's fault, we, we now kind of have a roster of people that are just kind of easy going, um, which has been great to really get everyone to be able to focus more on the X's and O's and, and be able to focus more on scouting and less having to talk about whether, what their teammates should have been doing this or that or whatever. So we're this season, I think we're finding some success of just having a little bit less um, BS going on behind the scenes uh, than maybe we have in years past. Um, But yeah, I mean, for me, coaching is a lot of that psychology factor of, of knowing each player. You can't coach players the same way. Everyone needs something a little bit different. Um, you have to recognize when someone needs to get pushed and when someone needs some time to breathe. And you also have to recognize when the guy that normally wants his time to breathe, maybe needs to get pushed a little bit. And, and, you know, it's never uh, just a black and white situation. And then the X's and O's is where I think I've always kind of um, thrived a bit, you know, in, in the sport and trying to give our team an advantage based on um, scouting and, um, just kind of trying to be a step ahead of the competition in that play calling scenario and trying to be unpredictable and um, willing to take the risks when they need to be risked. Um, and in the sport, um, sometimes you gotta, you gotta risk it and, and let your players uh, set them up for that advantage and trust in them. If you just put them in that early disadvantage that they can dig themselves out of it. Let me ask you this question, Ryan, because this is something that you, uh, you know, a lot of the top coaches do this. But, you know, we're kind of we're sitting there and I'm watching you guys play a game and I'm thinking, okay, you know, so they go pocket or sorry, they, you know, okay, risk, risk, Billy, don't risk, Billy, pocket, risk, Billy or risk, risk, LJ, risk, Cody, whatever. So you're you're kind of probing, you know, you're throwing offensive hits and seeing the read and react from your opponents. Do they shoot him? Do they not? Guy gets in there. How does he play? You know, without giving away the secrets to it, but. Like, how do you kind of go about that? I mean, I feel like that's another question I get a lot from guys playing, trying to get better because it, it that's that chess match side of things where it's like, when do you, you know, and I, again, I don't want you to give away like everything you do that makes you Ryan Bram, but I, mm-hmm. I whatever you're willing to share, I think would be crucial here because there's, 
there's just so much of that, man. It's like, it's tough. You know, it's tough to, as you're doing the rock, paper, scissors or the, you know, the, of, of, okay, do I risk this guy to the snake? Do I not risk him? Obviously layout contingent here. This is, that's a big, you know, caveat to this discussion, but there is a certain ebb and flow of risking your D side guys, risking your snake side guys. Is there from the psychological perspective, when those guys are getting shot or not getting shot match with the X's and O's from what you're seeing from your opponent, how does that work for you? Like, where do you, where do you go so, in that mindset to, to make those decisions? Because you're good at that. You know, sometimes it's like, okay, well, sometimes I'll think, oh, I think they should risk Billy. And then you guys don't. And then they shoot that spot. And, and then he stays alive and gets in there on a secondary. And then other times I'm like, they should risk Billy. And then you send him, you know? So it's like, but that's every buddy that knows the game is going to have different opinions of the ebb and the flow of when you should go offense and when you should hold back. Like, when should you play aggressively? When should you not? It's not textbook necessarily. Definitely. I mean, at a, there's two things going on kind of at a best uh, base level. Um, you have, you know, in most breakouts, you have three kind of designated shooters these days. And so you have two guys going out and you have your three guys shooting. And one's going to shoot the snake side. One's going to shoot the Drito side. And that extra body, they're either going to double lane on the snake or double lane on the Drios, right? And that's kind of just at a base level. It doesn't always happen like that, but that's kind of, you know, the fundamental of it. So where you're trying to risk is away from that extra shooter. You know, you don't want to be running the snake when they're that, that time they have two guns on it. You want them to guess wrong. Um, and so that's the first layer of it. Uh, and then when you add that second layer on top is, um, and I don't know in the higher divisionals or divisions, you probably see this more than the lower divisions, lower divisions, they're probably just shooting the widest spot. Hey, we're shooting for the snake or we're shooting for the, the first Torito. Once you get into the higher divisions, um, it's whether or not it's what gap are you shooting at the twos, the, the second, you know, the second guys on each side, or are you shooting at the ones or are you shooting at the, you know, the dead zones by the back center or shooting back in the back center. So that layer comes on top of it. So sometimes you're wanting to run um, if they're, you think they're going to be shooting at your, your back guys that you're choosing threes. Um, and sometimes you're wanting to, um, you know, stay short if they're shooting to runners and, and shoot heavy in the back. So there's a lot of, like, it's kind of like a positioning of where you think their guns are going to be. And, and you're trying to run away from that. And sometimes you want to reset the deck. Uh, say, for me, I'm always trying to get ahead, right? And I, what I mean by that is I want to be the one setting the tone to their coach who's trying to react to what we're doing. So like, oh, man, they're punishing down the snake. They're put, pointing their guns that are snake guys. All of a sudden, we don't go. And they just wasted their guns. That's frustrating for them. So then like, oh, shit. Well, they're not running the snake. They're trying to play it safe. So let's shoot at their back center player. Now we run the snake. We're like, oh, shit. Well, they're running the snake, so what's what shoot for the snake? And then I run the Dorito three off the break, right? And so it's you're trying to make them reactionary to what you're doing, um, yeah. And that's kind of where this whole game goes. And some coaches do it different than others, um, with more predictability. And that's kind of why you know when players are scouting uh, tape on players, sometimes I'm scouting tape on coaches and how they typically react. Um, yeah. and then on top of that, sometimes it's kind of like in blackjack where you maybe like, I'm talking about getting ahead, right? Well, maybe I feel like I'm behind, I'm reactionary to what the other team's doing. Um, and they, and I feel like they're one, they're one step ahead of us and they're shooting my guys. Well, sometimes in blackjack, you feel like you have a bad deck and you start playing two positions just to mix things up. So sometimes even though it's going wrong for you, uh, you just kind of do something that's maybe, uh, against your own changing. better judgment but changing yeah, up the variables just changing it up to try to, re to reset yeah, you're resetting the, the variables yeah mm -hmm. yeah and just try to reset things and now it's like you know maybe this coach has a read on me. maybe he, he i feel like i'm a little bit behind uh so the easiest thing for me to do in that position is do the opposite of what i think the right thing is to do at that moment That's and then great. if he's That's really true. on top of it so much sense you know, that yeah. makes so much sense just i don't want to yeah. interrupt but like seeing some of the decisions you make that makes so much sense. But also if I would, if I had to coach against you right now and I heard that, I'd be like, well, shit, that actually makes it harder because now I'm going to think about, okay, he's going to do this, but no, he's going to not going to do it. But maybe he's going to know he's not going to, he's going to do that. You know, so that's the type of 
but it, it, but at the higher level coaching stuff, like I just love that part of the game because when you are watching a team playing the same layout, layout over and over and over again, and you know, like, okay, Joey Blute's going to be there at, you know, so again, just taking damage for instance, because that's who you guys just played in the finals and they're looking pretty good right now, past couple years. And now it's coming off this win. But I, you know, I, like I, I, you know, I'm there every day, all day and call all the games. And so like, I know who's there all day, you know, like I know who shows up at noon. Mm-hmm. I know who shows up at seven o'clock in the morning. I, you know, like I, that's not, does not go unnoticed. And Joey's there for the first game every single time, even if he plays in the afternoon with this, a staff or two. And, and he's trying to figure out what everyone's trying to do. And, and I know that, you know, because you are the, I think the grand grandson of an astronaut. I can't remember if it was your dad or your grandpa. Anyway, I know you got some big brains. So yeah. So your grandson of an astronaut. So yeah, check out the big brains on Ryan brand, but you know, so you're going to, but that makes so much sense that when you're kind of sitting there and when you make that blackjack analogy, you're like, Oh, I'm gonna play two hands because I need to change the variables in this set. I'm stuck with this deck until they reshuffle. I'm not going to go anywhere. So when you're locked into a battle, you can't just tap out and be like, okay, we're going to reset at zero, zero. That's not how this works. So if you have to reset variables, sometimes throwing some sort of chaotic thing in there totally makes sense. And also seeing, seeing, you know, watching every single point your team has played while you've coached them. And a lot of those points multiple times, Ryan, that makes so much sense, but also that doesn't really make it any easier for me to predict <laughs> what you're going to try to do out there. But still. <laughs> yeah. But that's a very interesting, that's an interesting mindset. Cause I think some guys just get in the pressure of the moment. You know, some people that are coaching or leading teams get a little bit too methodical. They get a little bit too stuck into, they go to the default. Oh shit. Oh, Hey, we just lost two. And so, and so maybe did he blow his knee out? Did he not? Oh, the case of paint wasn't right. Whatever. There's all this stuff that's going on. Some people just go right into the default. Okay. Well, yeah, go to plan B, you know? And it's like, it's not really yeah. that simple, man, at the high levels. It, it, it's not, and I, and I will say that like not everyone on my team loves the fact of how I, they wish they had a plan A, B, and C. I just don't coach that way. Uh, so, you know, so it's it's one of those things that it's, um, it is a, a, a criticism I've gotten from uh, players at times that like, hey, like there's, it's a little, the way you're doing it's complicated. Um, and, but for me, my job is to take my complicated structure and, and get my players comfortable with it and, uh, cause the fault isn't, it's complicated. The fault is if they feel it's complicated cause they don't really know, you know, the, what all five players are doing on, on every play. And that's, that's to me, that's, I need to do a better job of explaining that that's the fault there, but it's, I don't make it complicated for my players. I make it complicated for the other team and who we're coaching against because, and, and it's easy actually when we find a team that's doing this, um, thing where it becomes very uh redundant or methodical and it's you know they have this play that's working every time for them when we watch tape i'm like oh we they're they're screwed um it's just one of those things it's like we're, we're gonna break that play down and then now they're gonna be playing a different play than they played this whole tournament to get to where they are on sunday um and so that's what we want so to me it's like yeah there's no i don't have a my playbook walking into a tournament is usually 250 blank sheets of paper, but that's just, <laughs> that's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk through your run at this last event. And, you know, it, it, again, it, it just, it, it's impressive because, you know, again, on the, X factor is such a compelling story. Been around for so long, been, you know, world champions, been a team that, I mean, I played against X factor when it first came up. That's how long this team has been around different incarnations of this squad. But if you just look at the the performance you guys have had in the last, say, you know, since the COVID break, you know, if we go back to 2020 now, we're heading to the end of the 2023 season. So a full three years, if we just take that, I mean, yeah, you know, last victory was in Chicago of, of, of uh, you know, 2019, but Jesus, dude, you guys have been pinnacle elite, you know, since then with a lot of third places, a lot of finals finishes. I mean, you know, again, if if people just got into this, the battles that Dynasty and X Factor had, you know, at the end of 2020, early 2021, um, incredibly impressive. And, uh, you know, I just, because you have had kind of some of these things that have, you know, players have gone, you lost Archie Montemayor, you lost Rainey Stanza. I mean, those are huge names. Um, And then, yeah, there was a little bit of a blip with the, 
you know, 16th place at the uh, first event in, in 2022 and then ninth at the Lone Star. But since then, it's been fourth, third, eighth, fifth, fifth, fourth, second. Like, that's pretty good, dude. You know, I mean, I know you guys are, that's failure to you guys because at your level, if, a, if, if you don't win, you're not, you know, it, then that's not a success. But, but Jesus Christ, dude, that's a really, really good run. So actually, before we kind of get into the run you guys had at this last event, you guys did just lose uh, Jesse Stevens. You know, he's kind of been a core guy over the years, coming on a little bit, though. Um, what is your interpretation of how that went down? Um, for Jesse, it's um, I guess it's just been difficult for him to find his his role on the squad and, and Jesse's at a point of his career and he's also at a talent level that he's, he's wanting to be um, a no question starting guy. And and Jesse's capable of doing that on, on a lot of rosters. So I understand where he's at and his frustrations, frustrations have been. Um, when Archie was on the team, um, you know, Archie would bounce around on the field wherever we felt, um, we needed Archie most, you know, where that most crucial spot would be. Uh, and so depending on where Archie was on the field kind of resulted in whether or not Jesse was getting a lot of reps in those years. So the best way to put it is like, if Archie came over to the Drudo side, um, Jesse got his reps kind of limited. And so I think when Archie left the team, I think Jesse really took it as like, this is my time to shine. And, and kind of be the guy. Um, and then in that off season, we got John Parrish um, and, and LJ kind of filled that role. And at the same time, Cody Bayless was really um, kind of finding his game after so many years. And, and Cody, yeah. you know, he, he was a starter on X factor in 2006, 2007, 2008. And then he went to the military. And when he got out of the military, he came back. And Cody's game was, you know, f- five, you know, six, seven years removed. Like he was not at the level. The only reason he was back on the team is because he was one of the original guys. And Cody just was, hey, I'll ride the bench. I, I'm, I'm here for the squad. And Cody, for I don't know how many seasons it was, three or four seasons, he played a few points at tournament, and he was just the best teammate you could have. You know, he just he kind of kept getting better, but he was just there to be part of the team and support the team. And Bayless just started to, to up his game and up his game and get more into the modern game. And then all of a sudden, you know, Bayless is sitting there and he's playing at a level that's just amazing. Uh, and, and between him and Parrish, like you can, you know, they're, they're just a perfect uh, a pair of just like, I'm sure you guys commentated, you don't know who's out there half the time. They're similar size. And they, they I, try so I try so hard. I try so I try yeah. so hard. Yeah. And LJ gives yeah. me shit about it all the time. And I'm like, bro, yeah. I'm trying as hard as I can, dude. Like you guys, yeah, it's, you're uh, Bayless, you're the exact same size. Bayless is a little thicker. They play the exact same game, though. Like it's and their their style yeah. is similar, but it's it's also good for you guys because it's hard to scout because like you don't really know if it's LJ or, or you know Bayless. Anyway, it, but yes, and I'm again so those, LJ. Yeah. So those two guys, Cody, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to get you guys. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> yeah. So those two are handling business, right? And then so and then Jesse kind of he's been kind of in and out, figuring out real life, and then it gets to the point where we're like, well, Bayless has done all this work. I'm not been the best teammate, done everything right. Like I'm not demoting Bayless back to the bench, and so there wasn't a lot of room for Jesse on the Drudo side anymore. Um, so it's, Jesse can play the snake. Jesse can, you know, play. A, he's he's a, a great front player. So we move him over to the snake side, um, and where he's played very well. Um, the only problem over there is that we got Billy Bernacci over there, and and he's so one of Jesse's the best kind of playing, in the history of the game ever, ever, like literally yeah, ever, yeah. ever. And it's not good. lost on Jesse. Still the best. Yeah, it wasn't best. lost on yeah. Jesse. Yeah, one of the best. And Jesse, there was multiple practices where Jesse. Uh, you could even argue that he's outplaying Billy at practice. And then we go to the tournament and Jesse's playing well, Billy's playing well. And then when it comes down to the crucial points and overtime and those things, like we're rolling with Billy because Billy's just, he's a rock, you know, he's just, there's not a, 
um, highs and lows to his game very much. It's just he's – if Billy – the only t- way to slow Billy down is to shoot him off the break. If Billy gets in there, the that's very, yep. very few mistakes, right? So we're rolling Billy, and I think for that it just – it was too difficult for Jesse um, to um, – you know, I think he's um, he, he struggled with it, right? Best way to buy it, as anyone would. And and when I, me and Jesse were going through this before he left, it, it just I'm not, I, I'm not even like, it. I would say maybe he didn't handle that his role the best, but I got seven, eight other guys on our team right now that also wouldn't handle that role very well. They all want to be on the field. Jesse wants to be on the field. Um, so at the time it was just best for him to find a place right now for him to be on the field. And I love the kid and I hope he finds that spot on the, on the field and I hope he thrives. Yeah. I, I love Jesse Stevens as a human being and as a paintball player, I've seen him come up since a boot rookie who was just constantly getting shot at his spot to being somebody that helped contribute to victories for San Antonio X factor and seen him blossom as a human and as a player. But I also agree with you, Ryan. I mean, it's tough, man. Like when we're, you know, you know, Billy Bernacci is one of the best snake players ever to play the game. And everyone knows that if you're going to play X factor, if you can't shoot Billy Bernacci, you're probably going to lose the game. Cause even if you contain him, even if he's alive over there and you didn't shoot him, like you still got to worry about him trying to finish. And then you putting so much pressure on Billy. Well, now the way that LJ and Cody and, you know, you got TJ and I mean, dude, you got a lot of finishers on your team, Cody. You know, it's like you have literally enlisted a lion's share of dudes that can finish paintball points because they're, you know, playing high level chess out there. And so, yeah, it would be if I was in your situation, as much as I love Jesse and we get into deep into Sunday, it's like I got to go with I got to go with Billy. You know, it's just like yeah. I get it, you know, and then. And then it's on the D side. I get it there too, because the way that Paris is, you know, that this is kind of the tough thing though, because Jesse also, and this is probably if I was Jesse, if I put my Jesse Stevens hat on for a second, I'm like, well, I play with reckless abandon too. And I've proven that I can do things in big moments too. Like, give me that, give me the chance, you know? And so, because, you know, with Parrish and Bayless, they haven't led a team to victory yet. You know, so if I'm Jesse, mm-hmm. he might think, all right, well, now I got a chip on my shoulder because I have helped X Factor in these situations. So I could see the frustration for him. But but some but this is just pro sports, man. Like this is just how it works. And I don't yeah. again, yeah, for sure. like Parrish, Parrish has been a machine over there. Bayless has been great coming in too. And like again, yes, I've seen I always want to see Jesse get some spins, but bro, like I can't at, in any way, shape, or form disagree with your expert opinion on this situation with your team, dude. And so if Jesse has a chance to go over, this is just, again, sports, dude. All right, man, if it's not going to work here, then go someplace you feel like you can get spins and prove it. Prove it to everybody. If anything, this should be fuel for your soul to go out there and prove to the world that you deserve, you should, that should have been you, you know? So I'm just, but so my question is, how do you think he's going to do in his new home? That would be my next question before we move on. From Jesse and Jesse, we yeah. wish you the best, brother. I, you know, like we all love you. So, you know, I think, and that's, and I guess to, to be clear too, it's like if if our team would have been better if Jesse wanted to be a backup snake player, right? If Jesse wanted to be Mike Urena to 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 Archie, right? And and then we would be a better team. Uh, but that's just he, that's not what he wants to do. So it just wasn't going to work. Um, and so when me and Jesse were kind of processing this and going through this together, um, you know, I, I helped reach out to some squads and stuff and, and there was interest for Jesse had, he had offers from teams that wanted him to come in and be their, their guy. Um, and Jesse chose, uh, the harder road. Um, and, and that's his prerogative and, and more power to him for it. Um, but he, he's got, he's got a hard, you know, I, I would say he, he probably inserted himself into kind of a potentially similar situation uh, in Diesel, but he's going to get to what he's been told. And, and I talked to Mark Johnson before this went down um, that he has the opportunity to win the starting spot over there. And to be frank, on he the wasn't snake, on the snake the side as the one on the snake on side. the Dorito side as on the Dorito. Side. Okay. Dur- okay. And so that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's the beauty of Jesse. He can play multiple spots. But they're going to they're open to giving sure. him that opportunity. 
And to be frank, we this season we did we weren't open to giving Jesse the opportunity. He could have played his fucking balls off in practice, and and we um, we we knew what we were wanting to do as a team. And so he he took uh, of the options he had. He can slot in and be a starter on multiple teams, or he can go and prove that he can be a starter on one of the most talented rosters in the league. That's what he went for, and that's who Jesse is. He's a competitor, uh, yes, and I'm rooting for him. I hope he, I hope he pulls it up. You know, it, it's not going to be uh, the easiest of the roads, but you know, that's who Jesse is. He's not going to take the. He wants. He wants the challenge, and I, I hope he wins it out. Uh, as far as yeah. look, there's two two hundred ish pro players, and so there are about two hundred stories playing themselves out in the microcosm of the player narrative, with the macrocosm of all these different teams fighting for that win. To me, heading into the Chicago with Jesse going to Diesel specifically, like how what spins he gets and how he does, because you know, dude. Hinman does not suffer any fools. I just saw, and I'm not saying that Jesse is far from a fool, but my point is, is that he, like Mike Hinman is going to play whoever goes out there and kills people and he's not going to deal with any shit. So like, he's a very hardcore coach to play for. And I'm very interested to see, and I think he's going to do well, especially in the stage of life that Jesse's in. I think he's going to do well over there. Um, I think it, it could be good for him, but, but that is from a personal standpoint, of all the stories that are going to play themselves out in Chicago, I want to see what happens to Jesse Stevens on, on Diesel. Because Diesel has a lot to prove. Jesse has a lot to prove. He could go out and, and you know, I mean, like like we've seen from him before, that could be a big moment for him. I hope he doesn't put that much pressure on him, but on himself. But it is but it is what it is. Um, let's just real quick, because, uh, you know, dude, we could talk for hours and I can't keep you here all night, but. Um, mm -hmm. let's just kind of talk through this roster, dude. You know I mean? You, you do have, and we, we were kind of touching on it a little bit. Um, and I, we don't have to dwell here too long cause we have talked about this, but I feel like, you know, some of these legends that are just representing you guys as the twos and the threes, you know, look, yeah, we we're talking a lot about Billy Bernacci on the snake side, but this is just why you guys have been so consistent because if you look at your starting roster, it is absolutely just ridiculous. You know I mean? This is kind of one of those embarrassments of wealth in a way that's not a team that you know like yeah sure you guys will pay dues to play paintball but like not at the not, not where some of these other teams are at so if you just kind of start snake side yeah billy bernaccia but dude meaner ninos has been so fun to watch and colt roberts and i know colt floats and meter super versatile too but you know kind of talk me through stacking colt and meter a little bit uh behind billy um again i know you you're playing jazz with things you don't want to be super predictable but I've seen Colt Roberts and, and Meter Ninos devastate people as the two on the snake side of the field. Talk me through that a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll start with Meter that he's just, uh, he's just smooth out there. He just is, you know, he doesn't play with any fear um, and he just gets it. And to me, like he's the perfect cleanup player um, mainly because he's got the athleticism as a one um but reads the field you know as good as anybody and so when he sees a window to, to kind of clean up a game or make that move he can make it a lot quicker and smoother than most of those people i would say he's maybe the most similar to to ryan greenspan on the field today um as someone that can shift that quickly and 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 just really break things right wide open um so uh, that's kind of where we are on that uh, so yeah, meter's honestly one of my, my favorite dudes on the field. And, and sometimes it's just meter really finding his groove. And once he gets in it, you know, I, I would say that we had a lot of guys firing at that last tournament, but uh, meter was just, he was on one. Like he was having an event. Um, and um, especially in that finals match, you know, it, it's, you know, it would have been hard to pick a finals MVP maybe, but uh, for me, it, it was probably a meter, you know, it, it, it would have been hard, but. He, he was just on it. Um, and then Colt, you know, the old dog is you know, just anything he's asked of, he, he, he excels, you know, and you know, for the longest time, Colt was our one on the Dorito side. And then we had Colt back up and play the two on the Dorito side. Um, and he was, you know, and then Archie and Colt were, were flip flop. And, and then now it's, you know, TJ's kind of slotted and owned that role. And hey, where do we need help? And, and Colt's like, all right, well, I can help here. I can, and now he's moving to the same side. You know, Colt's a, 
a 40 year old man that can play every position on the field, you know, and he'll, he'll joke about catching snake back if you let him, but, um, he, he's getting in there. Right. And, he, and he's bunkering people and handling business and, and Colts just, um, you know, he's, a, he's our, our captain and he's just a, you know, everything you could want from a guy, he's doing it. He's in better shape now than he has been, you know, five years leading up to this. Um, so it's just great to be where he's at. Um, you, and then, um, you know, you keep going over TJ is just the, the real, the real rock cleanup guy at our team, the communicator, um, very few mistakes made elite gunfighter, um, super intelligent. Um, I think, um, you know, he's probably, I think everyone on my team now is a bit of a, a soundboard, uh, for me on, on kind of concepts and stuff like that. But, you know, when TJ was going through his injury on AC Dallas, like he's actually coached at the pro level. He's coached in a pro finals. Um, it's good to have someone that's had to go, go through the practices and go through the matches and actually be in that coach role, uh, to have that as a player. He just, he understands it at a high level. So it's, it's great to have him there. Um, you know, we've been through the Drudo guys, we've, we've between Parrish and, and, and Bayless and, and both of them are just, they're just two no bullshit, no excuses. Um, they fuck up. Hey, I'm sorry. Um, they, they just are, as far as players at that level and sometimes ones you get uh, you know, some egos involved and all those types of things. But both of those guys, like, you know, yes, they play with a chip, but they don't play with a, an ego. They're selfless and, and to each other as well. They want each other um, to succeed, you know, and, and both of those guys want to be on the field in overtime. Don't get me wrong, but they're also, if the other one's playing, they want to win, you know, and they don't care if it's Bayless or Bar Parrish or, interchangeable they just they want to win so it's great to have that kind of situation going on over there um and then tom guest is our uh that's our wild card that has just been leveling up his game so much like so incredibly much that um you know when he first came in kind of a you know a role player um you know he's our center guy for big bunkers he's the tall guy and then we were kind of been working on his game out of the back and his communication and, and now it's just tom's just in there he's a sniper. He's hitting huge shots. He's communicating. It's just, he's leveled up um, so much over the past um, two seasons, but it's almost like a event by event leaps and bound growth at this point. And Tom's been around, you know, for a while in the pro division, a few years, but um, I don't know. I don't, it's just, it's really clicking for him. And it's nice to see because, you know, with all our guys, they're, you know, we've been playing for so long that there's growth and there's learning, but it, it's as, as much as like, you're not going to see like some of these massive levels of growth. Um, and it's beautiful to see it with Tom. And, and, and I, that's pretty much our, I think that's our whole roster. I mean, if I, yeah, that's your roster. That, so no, that's that, roster. well, you obviously you got, you got Alex, um, which is yeah, the Alex, oldest yeah. man ever to get a point in the NXL. And, you know, he's a paintball painter and God bless, uh, Alex Martinez. Um, yeah. the, the one question. So, you know, and Alex, is, uh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. I was just, just to cap that off is the point is like, you know, Alex, sometimes he suits up. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he feels he's go out, get out there and shoot some people off the break for us, which he's great at. Uh, and he's always at practice balling and this team doesn't happen without Alex. Um, but I think the beautiful thing we have on our team right now is that, um, all those guys I just listed off, uh, all of them have played in overtime points in the past three events, every single one of them. Um, and that's our whole team. And so we don't have a lot of fringe guys at all. Um, and, oh, and we, Mikowski, we didn't, we didn't talk about Mikowski, who's just stepped in and been huge yeah, Cody. Yeah, um, Cody. Yeah. Cody. Yeah. And sure. Cody is, and Cody's. He's just still getting his feet wet and he's playing a lot of points. You don't get me wrong, but I mean, he's, he's still uh, getting comfortable and, and he's doing great, but I, there's even more in there, right. For, for that to fully gel. And, you know, in Chicago, I think it's, we're at 90%, you know, it's, it's not like it's anything lagging around, but um, our team's just getting better. You know, it's like, we're, and we're getting to this point where, um, it's not a big giant roster. We're not always people carrying 11, 12 players like you're seeing now on some of these big teams. Um, but there, there's no real fluff. Uh, and some of those rosters, not to offend anybody, but there's a little bit of fluff on some of those. Um, 
and it's just great. You know, like we're, we're in team meetings and there's nobody that's riding the bench, uh, which is great because you have everyone at the top level, everyone wants to compete, right? There's everyone wants to be there. So when you have a big roster and uh, those anomaly um, tournaments we talked about, where we got a 16th place and whatever, I think we were carrying 12 bodies, 11 bodies um, before we started. And where the tide turns is where we trim the fat. Um, well, and, and not even dude, also, go ahead. no, we just, you know, look, I, yeah, dude, if you, if you feel Archie on your team for a half decade or sorry, a decade mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you lose Archie. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, then he went on to just take a sigh to the league, dude, just like cutting heads off, uh, on dynasty and winning an MVP. Um, the fact that you were able to take that hit. And, you know, and again, you obviously you're going to have your people that are like, oh, you know, X Factor's done. It's like even when Dynasty would lose, like they lost Tyler. Oh, Dynasty's done. Like, come on, guys. Like these teams have been around for a generation. Like that one player does not make a team. But when it is an iconic player, you have to adjust to it. Dude, that's what I'm saying. Like the fact you guys adjusted to that and then you lose Rainey and now you're getting adjustments. It's like, dude, you guys are uh, not only are you fine, you're thriving. And you have, like you said, so this badass roster, which I agree is badass. Uh, the one question that, that kept creeping up post MAO mid Atlantic ma- or mid Atlantic major now, because MAO mid Atlantic open, but was why did you guys send out Tom guest as the one-on-one guy, you know, cause you know, it's like you go through this laundry list of dudes and I love Tom guest. Tom guest is a monster gunfighter. I'm writing voiceover right now for our, you know, road to the finals. Uh, trying to finish up the last little bit. And I would describe Tom Guest as a, you know, as a monster gunfighter from Canada because he is, you know, like he's a monster gunfighter. He's really good at gunfights. He's really good at off break shots. Like he's dialed. He play, you know, he's a big dude, but he can play, like he plays very dynamic. His snapshot is absolutely nasty. So I don't necessarily disagree with you sending Tom out if you felt that Tom was the hot hand, but knowing that you have like Meter, who's one on one on one tournament. Cody Mikowski was one on one, one a one on one tournament. You know, you got Colt Roberts, like he's good in those situations. I was just kind of wondering again, I'm not second guessing it, just wondering because I know how good Tom Guest can be. So I was just kind of wondering if he came off like a one on one tournament win the past week, you know, the weekend before with the boys. Uh, because you know, guys will have that will happen occasionally. So, I, but I was just wondering because when we're sitting there talking through it. Again, I'm not saying anything against Tom. He's a monster gunfighter. I'm not just fucking being PC because of some bullshit. Like, I'm just calling it like it is. Like, you know, but I could see you sending Tom out if he just had was on a hot streak. I'm wondering, was he on a hot streak? What was the methodology behind that? Because you had TJ. I mean, uh, Billy's not a great one-on-one guy necessarily, but he's Billy Bernaccia. And then you get Meter and Cody who have one. I'm just wondering, like, what, what happened in that moment? Like, take me to that moment. Yeah. It's the one-on-one situation and Tom Guest goes out. Yeah, I'll relive it one last time for you. Um, so I <laughs> sorry, what I gotta ask the questions. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ryan, but I gotta no, 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 no. Um, so uh, to, to be candid, um, and, and this is I guess this will be a little long winded story, but that's the only way to really get it out correctly. That's what this is for, um, bro. Tell the tell the whole yeah, story. Yeah. So uh, me as part of my role as a coach on our team too is is making sure we're prepared for pretty much every scenario. Um, and I've been coaching this team, you know, since 2010 or 11. Um, and guess how many one-on-ones we've gotten in where we, you know, in overtime, it was one, it was this last turn. Yeah. I was going to say, it's the only time we ever, dude, I don't think it's ever happened to you guys. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now, now, me personally, I like to go through these scenarios, all these what ifs, right? And we've gotten close, you know, we've gotten close, but it's just never happened. You know, at the end of overtime, you know, the clock doesn't expire. And so I've always had this plan and I have a structure, uh, how I wanted to go down. I have a strategy in place, um, but I never felt it was worth the brain space uh, until now. Uh, this is my learning lesson to talk about that with my team, right? I never thought it was worth yeah. the, hey guys, but if we in five minutes on this overtime point, and by the way, if we go to one on ones, this is who's going out and this is who's going out next, or 
you know, at the meeting before, hey guys, you know, we got to win, you know, all these matches tomorrow, but, and here's the one-on-one line. <laughs> it's just something I've never personally yeah. felt like um, had a level of importance because in my head, uh, you know, just like every play in the past decade, uh, everyone comes to me on the clipboard to figure out what's going to happen. You know, like what, what's the play? Uh, there hasn't been a single time that I haven't called the play. Um, so in this particular instance, and mind you, I've never been in a one-on-one in a tournament. Uh, I don't think any of our guys have. Been. Um, um, so uh, maybe Billy played one and seven man long, long time ago. And so, <laughs> but other than that, it, it's just, you know, one years ago. so th- back when they did that 15 years ago, because then they went to three on three. So, yeah. Um, so we basically after Billy gets shot and we lose the numerical superiority um, in that, in that game. And then it looks like it's going to stalemate. Uh, I, I knew this, I knew it was, I believe a two minute clock, but I was like, you know, I'm going to go confirm. And I knew you didn't have to hit the buzzer, but you know what? I'm going to walk over to Trozen and confirm the rules while there's still 15 seconds left on overtime. Uh, just to, I want to send my guy out there prepared. And I also, this is me being a little bit unprepared. Well, there's not a lot of tape on this for me to watch to see how the scenario plays out. I I thought the game, the game would end and then it would stop. And then it would kind of be this like build from the crowd and it'd be like, all right, who's, who's your champion? Everyone send out your champions. Are you guys ready? You know, let's get ready to, to rumble or whatever. Um, literally the, the game clock ends and the clock for the one-on-one starts running like immediately, which I think is a minute and 30 seconds or something. Um, mind you, while this st- is happening, this clock is ticking. I'm talking to Troz and confirming the rules, which is probably mistake number three I've made in this scenario. So I start oh, walking over great. to my pit. Yeah, Ryan, this is a great story, uh, by the way. Than, this is a, this is a, this yeah. is a great story, by the way. <laughs> this is a great story. You still there? Let me freeze. Yeah. Okay. Now I got okay. you. Okay. Got it. So, so, and, and Jason's, uh, Trozen's closer to the damage pit than mine. So I'm over talking to Trozen. All right. Confirm the rules. Yes. You don't have to hang it. You know, as long as you put a ball in them before time expires. So I'm walking over to my pit to tell the player that I've had in my head for the past three seasons that, hey, here's the rules, get out there. Assuming they also know he's he's going out there. And on my way back over there, there's utter chaos taking place in our pit of everyone yelling who they think it should be going out there. And I'm just like, and I'm like, oh my God. But like at the same time, it's like, well, well, whatever. It's you know, it's it's my decision. I'm not I'm not freaking out at this point. I'm just watching this chaos take place. Um, so I walk up to the player, and he he's coming off the field. He was on the field for that long five minute overtime point, and the prior point before that, right? TJ? It was it was TJ. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. TJ, and, yeah so I'm going TJ. for TJ. And, yeah. Yeah. So TJ was the last guy alive in regulation. He played every point in the yeah. match. And he just played the five minute overtime and he was on the field for the whole thing. And so I walk up to TJ and I'm like, all right, it's like, all right, here's the deal. You're ready to go. And the, and on the clock, there's like 40 seconds left. Who's got to be out there. And TJ's like gassed. And in, in his response is, um, I think it should be Tom. And, and in TJ's um, defense, um, we do one-on-one tournaments at, at home, probably not as many as damage does at every practice. And since Tom's been on the team, Tom wins a lot of these one-on-one tournaments. Yeah. Um, and I think, and, but that was, you know, TJ's he's gassed. He's, you know, he, and honestly, I think him and Tom even talked, Tom said something like, man, I hope it comes down to one-on-ones. I want to be the guy or something. Cause Tom's yeah. confident in his one-on-one ability. Yeah. He wins them at home. Yeah, of course. Well, for me, particularly, um, Tom had only played two points that match. Um, there wasn't a lot of points played, and he didn't play in any of the last three. So he's a little cold. 
Um, he played well, but he was, we, we slimmed up and he was a little cold at the time. Um, Tom's also like, as far as like the veterans on our team, um, it just, it was a really big moment. I think to put Tom in there and in, in, in my, in my personal judgment to where uh, for the finals at the line, uh, if it was the prelims, uh, maybe quarterfinals or something, maybe it would have been Tom in my head. But at the time, it just he wasn't my second choice. Um, and but the second TJ said it should be Tom, um, I, I, you know, some of our guys just heard that. And in the chaos, rather than saying, all right, well, what does Ryan think, who probably spends too much time thinking about this? They just hear that and like, all right, well. Ryan gave this guy the ball. This guy said it should be this guy. Our job as a team, especially with this clock that now has 45 seconds on it, is to amp this guy. Pump that dude up. The the second DJ goes, I think it should be Tom, another player goes, yeah, let's go, Tom. And then all the players that weren't by me and these other two players just hear, yeah, let's go, Tom, assuming I said let's go, Tom. And the whole team erupts with, let's go, Tom. And then I'm sitting there going, okay, this isn't my second choice right now. But, you know, paintball is a big thing about momentum, positive energy. I believe in the paintball gods. And I'm just like, I'm not going to stop this train right now. And I'm also, I'm not sitting there going, oh, well, we're fucked. You know, I'm like, all right, Tom, Tom can ball. He he wins the one-on-ones. Tom didn't, to Tom's credit, he didn't hesitate. He's like, all right give me some air. You know, he didn't, he didn't skip a beat, you know, and he went out there and yep. he handled Good it. He him. did what he was asked of. Um, but that's how Tom got out there. Um, and he's no matter if TJ wasn't gas, no matter, you know, if I would have put out meter or, 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 or Mikowski next or Colt, um, you're still facing off against Jacob Edwards, who's the opposite of Tom in this situation where Jacob's literally won a, a shitload of tournaments and he's, one of the only tournaments in the, league, in the league currently that has won a tournament in a one-on-one. One of the only two ones. In a year. Yeah. Two in a year now. Yeah. Two in, in a year. year. Yeah. But I was saying, but he yeah. that's who he's facing off against. The guy that had just yeah. did it. And so yeah. to me, you need someone who is a bit of a psychopath that has no fear. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? And so in my head, that's, that's, um, uh, probably why Meter would have been out there for me because I just he doesn't give a <laughs> fuck. He's gonna go gunfight anybody. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Or someone you know that's just uh, has the confidence of at how many. Uh, I don't know if TJ comes up to you to co- collect his red coins. I, I I would argue he probably doesn't, but you probably have a baggie full for him uh, of the past ten events. Like <laughs> TJ, that's why he's my guy. He wins them all the freaking time. You know, if we get in a one-on-one in, a, in an event, it's automatic that I'm writing down the next play as if it's TJ out there, as if yeah. the score is already locked in with one up. So um, so that was kind of where my level was. But at the same time, you're facing off against Jacob. You know, it's just a uh, yeah, no, he's I, an animal. It, it, that, yeah. Bro, that's an incredibly difficult situation to be in that was an incredibly entertaining uh <laughs> jaunt down the story lane wow yeah that's that's a shitty spot to be in but I, but i also agree with you too man i mean look we also at, you know from a commentator's booth when that happened we have i have been there before and i was and I, i'm always begging for one-on-ones and when it went to one-on-ones i've been thinking about it for the past two and a half minutes in my head, you know, I'm calling the game. All oh, this is happening, blah, 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 blah. But in the back of my mind, I'm also like, okay, well, what's my call going to be if we do go to one-on-ones? What am I going to think about? Like, what am I what am I thinking about currently? So as I'm saying the moves that are happening, I'm also like, well, if I was Ryan, who would I send out? And I'm now remembering, okay, well, we had an ultimate shootout. And Meteor and Cody did spectacular in the ultimate shootouts. TJ also, like you said, that dude is just printing red and gold coins. They're over in my closet over here. I have I have some, but uh, you know, to give them out. And yeah, he's he's got a few. He's come got some from me, but I probably owe him more because that dude just prints red and gold coins from Hormesis, the coin duel, because that dude wins one on ones like it's his job. You know, so it, when I was sitting there and I was like, well, who are they going to send out? Is it going to be TJ Danner? Is it you know who's their w- recent one on one stud, or is it going to be? 
you know, one-on-one champs, Meter Ninos or Cody Minkowski. But then when it, and I look down and I see Tom go out, I'm like, okay. But in my head, I'm thinking, all right, well, Tom Guess is fresh. TJ just played, like you said, he played every single point all the way through the finals, like might be gassed. And if there's a, and like, so at the, the one we had in Texas, sometimes guys will go out and play one-on-one for a minute and then we won't get a winner. And then you have to send your next guys out, you know? So, so and I'm thinking, okay, well, and that's, there are, that's like part you of my said, strategy there are no, with TJ. Uh, he's not going to take a bad gunfight. So I can send yeah. TJ out there and potentially burn out Jacob. You know, it's, it's one of those, you know, that, you know, and that's kind of where I thought this thing out and just didn't play out how I wanted it to, but it's one of those, I agree with you. Like, I know, I know Cody Mikowski can win fucking one-on-ones. I coached them, you know, it's like, I, uh, you know, it's one of those things. Like, I know these things. <laughs> and there it is. Um, the champion, yeah, bro. Yeah. So he had to like, go and just bring yeah. in, he had to bring in the receipts. Yeah. He got receipts. The receipts. So it's like, I know, and actually I got that. That was actually from Yaya's. Yeah, yeah. So I know if, uh, if I wish I could uh, coach this one-on-one a little bit better because I have a, I have a, uh, you know, a, a record, you know, to, to protect, but, uh, unfortunately I didn't you know do it. Um, and maybe I could have put my foot down and maybe I should have, and maybe I shouldn't have, honestly, uh, it became Tom's moment and it's a one-on-one, you know, and, and honestly, uh, if he would have won it, then, you know, amazing for him. And honestly, he lost it and it's been amazing for him because, Tom Guest has played more paintball than anybody I know since that moment. And Tom before was a guy that he's got a busy life. It's a long drive to get a paint, to a paintball field in Canada for him. Um, you know, he, it's a long travel to get to um, to Texas for him. You know, and he's got a he's a wedding photographer. He misses some practices, and since um, that moment. Uh, Tom's playing paintball what seems like multiple times a week, he's playing during the week. He's canceling weddings, messing with his money to make practices that are just extra practices. Um, I think it's awakened the beast a little bit. And sometimes, um, you know, Tom, you know, wasn't put on this team to win one-on-ones in overtime. He's put on this team to, to play and help us win points and matches. So, yeah, we might have given uh, – give him a tournament away uh, in the moment where he lost a one-on-one. But if that's going to help Tom excel for events and years to come, um, and I'll never not take the tournament win because they're very elusive, right? But uh, yeah. it's not a bad consolation prize to, to get a, a better player out of it. Well, and also, brother, I, I do, I mean, and yes, also like you had said in this intricate discussion here, you're sending whoever it w- would have been. It didn't matter. I'm not saying that they would have lost. Maybe they would have won. Maybe, you know, if Meter went out or Cody went out or Colt went out or whatever, whoever, TJ, whoever it was, maybe they would have beaten the beast that is Jacob Edwards. But Jesus Christ, dude, like, if I'm going to bet my child's life on somebody in a, in a one-on-one situation right now in pro paintball, it's going to be Jacob Edwards. Because that dude had, you know, talk about a psychopath in between the nets. That dude, and I love Jacob. Like, Jacob's a good dude. We'll sit there and talk about golf and kids and shit and, like, you know, just have regular conversations. But in between those nets, he is an absolute psychopath. Like, it doesn't matter what happens. He could just got, he could have walked out into a ball, got obliterated, or balls multiple, like, plural, got obliterated or made five bad moves in a row. That dude still in his mind is like, I'm the best player in the world, and I'm going to go absolutely devastate these next, these dudes in this next situation. And that's yeah. kind of what it takes. And, and, um, and that's what it takes. And Jacob was gassed. I want, you see it on the replays. He can, he's trying to, he's walking down the field because he's gassed. But, you know, for him, the moment, it, it, he knew it was his and he wouldn't took it. And I think we all, little learning moments everywhere. You know, I've talked to TJ and he's like, hey, I don't care how gassed I'm in. I don't care if I'm injured next time. I'm going in. And that's where his head's at now. You know, so there's, in every loss, there's, there's a, there's learning moments, right? You, you get better for it. But at the end of the day, if we get another one-on-one, um, cool, great. We'll be more prepared for it. But statistically, and you, you know, I like to, to look at these statistics. The, the worst thing for our team to do is to look back at that tournament and say, man, we lost because of this one-on-one. How, how can we get better at one-on-ones? You know, the, the, 
this thing to do is look back and say, all right, we lost this tournament because we didn't win it in regulation. We didn't win it in overtime when we had the ball and should have. That's what we need to focus on to fix, and that's how we get better. That's how we win tournaments. Um, no, 100%. Yeah, it, that was just a very strange moment. There are, I'm hoping that will be one-on-ones in the future, but to, but it's a, it is a rare occurrence. Now, we are going to see the frequency of that tick up a little bit in in time if we continue to have the strategy be um when you get into deep into sunday to play like a more controlled defensive style of paintball so the chances of that will elevate but it still will i mean even though i this is a historical anomaly like we yes we've seen these different there uh, different times there was a you know if you if you guys have never seen this one go on youtube and uh it was a uh, Orlando champs and challengers. It was in the challengers division and it was infamous versus dynasty. And it went to like five one-on-ones. That was to this day, probably the most exciting paintball game I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've seen all of the paintball games, uh, but that was, yeah, we should have done it that way at the last event. So <laughs> yeah, th- that would have been tight. Uh, yeah. And I'm definitely a supporter yeah. of that in the finals for sure. Cause like we have a half hour of daylight to burn, but, um, yeah. but, you know, before I let you go, I do I do want to touch base on on um you know we so we got the you know the the brackets for the next event. It would be another two and a half hours probably if you, if we discuss these brackets thoroughly. Um, but I do kind of want to touch on some of these top teams that are big stories right now. Um, some of these teams you've played recently. Um, kind of want to start with New York Extreme. So you know, New York Extreme uh was a team that you scrapped out a one point victory over in the quarterfinals. Um, this is a team that is, has, uh, only lost, I think two games in, uh, I'm sorry, one game in, in all of the prelims for 2023. And it was against uprising, I think in, in event one, uh, every time I, I sit down and I crunch the numbers and I look at the plus minus. So you guys took like, for instance, so you guys took a uh, second place. So, you, and you guys fought a lot longer than New York extreme did. So this is a nuanced conversation. But your plus minus was 33 points for 24 points against for a plus nine. Uh, you know, damage was a plus 18. Dynasty was a plus 19. Um, and heat was a plus 12. New York Extreme plus 19, dude. 28 points for nine, nine against. Like, they've just been really, really, really good, dude. Like, I have never seen like a, 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 them play this good. And mm-hmm. it's been really impressive. I mean, yeah, they keep losing these one point games on Sunday to, to the better teams that are higher ranked, but they're ranked fifth overall. And it's not by a lot uh, uh, 461 versus 487 heat. And then uh, at fourth and New York extreme fifth. And, and they've been doing with the, doing it with this core roster, you know, uh, Rich Telford is one of my best friends. So, and he is, uh, that's a dude who doesn't pull any punches when it comes to letting, letting you know what he thinks this, the, the straight deal is on a situation. Like he's the king of that. That's why I loved having him as a captain, um, for our squads back in the day when we were, you know, on Ironman and excessive, cause you know, he didn't mince any words and, and, and write more often than he's wrong. Um, but he's been pretty harsh on these dudes and they've gone fourth, fifth, fifth, and when I talk to Rich, he's as a good coach, you know, as a harsh coach will say, uh, you know, he it still has all these different things they need to work on. But Jesus Christ, dude, they've been really good. And um, and now they get Silos, and I think they're gonna have Jerry Carl for this next event. I know I think Tim uh, Tim Stetzel's out again. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on New York Extreme? Again, a team you just beat by uh, one point, a team that's been outstanding. Yeah, they're legit. They are. Um, now I, I just caught wind of this recently. I had to go back and, and watch the match to, to fully understand it because, um, I guess it's come to light that there was a clock mal- malfunction, malfunction in our match. Yes. Um, are you aware of this? Yeah. Um, yes, I am. But aware. so, and so basically there was, we played an extra two minutes, uh, a game time and, but, and so they're claiming, well, we were down by one with two minutes left. So technically they should have won the match. Um, but I went back and watched it, trying to figure this all out. Well, the clock, this malfunction took place when the score was zero to zero. Um, 
And it also malfunctioned on my end because I was trying to concede the point for 30 something seconds at the same time because the clock was broken. Unbeknownst to everyone out there, I just couldn't concede. And we finally had to have the refs like stop the game. And they didn't reset the clock appropriately. Um, but I would just say to them, if they really think that, I don't know if it's like we would have been down zero to one with what's called nine minutes left or 12 minutes left opposed to being down zero to one with 14 minutes left or something like this. Um, if you don't think I know how to manage a game clock, you haven't been paying attention very long. Um, so if that's what <laughs> you guys really think that that's like, and I hundred percent give it to them. If, if this malfunction would have happened and like where we were right, down multiple right. points and they, and they could have, uh, you know, played slow ball or adjusted or something like that. Uh, then I, I understand they have a case to make, but the score was zero to zero. Uh, so that's all I'll, I'll say about that. But aside from, I thought that was funny. But aside from that, those guys are legit. They're playing great ball. Uh, it's impressive uh, the leaps and bounds they've made. It's impressive how they, um, I think we've all knew it for a long time. And, and I'm not going to try to put this on Harris or not, but it's like they just were, they had too much distraction going on. Not only, from one player's like on-field antics, but the all of them trying to like have this persona out there and trying to play with this like uh, get in your head type thing, and they're worrying about trying to intimidation intimidate the competition or who knows what they're trying to do or put on a show, which was great to watch as a fan. They were my favorite team to watch, um, but once they eliminated that, um, they're just they're legit. You know those guys can ball. Uh, they're sound. They're solid. Um, they make good decisions. They're well coached. Um, and not only by Rich, but Dan Lee is also doing a great job. Um, oh yeah, they're Very they're right. a legit team. Yeah. And um, and um, Silos is going to help them. You know, he just gives them another elite, um, you know, front player threat. And especially because you know, you know, they lost. They didn't have Carl last event, and I think they're um, Hennessy played well, but he is a little bit. Um, the speed isn't at that elite level, at least in my opinion. Um, but he plays, you know, really well. But he's just he's not as uh, aggressive as a Jerry or a Silos. Um, so and and Hennessy had a great tournament. I don't want to take anything away from him. It's just a different style of player. So now if they do, they're just more deep. If they do lose, um, a guy gets hurt or goes down with gas, Silos really helps out. Um, Silos has bounced around uh, quite a bit. Um, I don't know him all that well, but I do think his game is legit. Um, why he's having trouble finding a home, I can't speak to. But if he did just find a home on NYX, it's it's probably a good place to be right now because they're trending in the right direction. Yeah, it's it's one of those situations where Carl's been their magic ticket on the snake side. Uh, Stetzel's been, you know, there barely at all in this current rise, and then Hennessy has been their you know kind of go to consistent dude. I definitely agree with you that. You know, and again, you know, we say this a lot, but you know, Will's a good guy. He's a really good paintball player. But when we are talking about the elite of the elite, Will needs to take his aggressiveness to another level if he wants to put that team on his back to go win a paintball tournament. And that's kind of the that's the question when you to me that we are discussing right now with New York Extreme, because you know, it's kind of like I remember ML Kings made like four Sundays in a row. And I showed up in the parking lot at, uh, I think it was uh, Golden State Open, and uh, saw those guys out there. And I was like, hey, you know, it was kind of, you know, very congenial with those dudes. I'm like, hey, man, you know, hey, what's up, guys? You know, this is like Thursday before the event. I'm like, hey, man, you guys have been looking really good. You're making these Sundays. Like, this could be a good feel for you. Um, you know, maybe this will be your moment. You know, the like guy's been pr- kind of pretty good. And somebody, I can't remember who it was, had been like, we've been good. You know, and I was like, and at that point, mm-hmm. I was like, all right, dude. Yeah. Like, all right, the, the blinders are off. Um, I'm about to, you know, I'm going to tell you what I really think. And I'm like, look, here's the deal. Like, you guys have made four Sundays in a row and you haven't done shit. You've made it to the first round of Sunday and got blown out at almost every single time. So, yeah, you've had, de- you know, decent amount of close games. But, like, at this point, it, it, like, I'm not going to pat you on the back just because you made it a Sunday. Like you made four Sundays in a row. Like, so what are you going to do now? You know, like I expect you to make Sunday and I expect you to make to the, make it to the next round because the training wheels are off. Like, you know what you're getting. You've been here before. 
You have no excuses. You have your core roster. Like if you don't make it past the first round of Sunday, then you guys have some shit to fix. And you know, Kyle Barry was like, yeah, hundred percent dog. You know, <laughs> Mingos, you know, some of the older guys were like hundred percent, bro. Like this, that's how it is. So with New York extreme, that's my challenge to them. Like, okay, congratulations. You guys have made it to Sunday at every single event here. The first three events, you made it to a top four. You've had some, but it's a little bit different for them. Like they've had a lot of close games, but okay, what are you going to do now? You know, like, okay, you, you've now jumped. I, we, we set up the, we set up the, you know, the obstacle course and you have now jumped this height. So I know you can jump this high. What are you going to do next? And that's kind of the question is that, okay, well, if you, if, if Carl's there and he's healthy and he's motivated, then that's one of the biggest threats you have to deal with on the snake side in the league. Um, and Silos has, has, you know, proven his chops too. You know, I mean, there's a reason why people keep giving him chances, you know, and so and he deserves those chances. So now he's going to get another chance to be a premier one uh, on a team that's making Sundays. And that's like we talked about with Jesse. To me, New York Extreme is one of the most compelling stories in the league. What are they going to do now? Are they going to continue to murder people yeah. in the prelims? Because it's literally been mostly New York Extreme by first degree murder. Again, I'm sitting on plus 19s. Like, I mean, they went through. I mean, they beat they beat Impact by four. It was uh, they beat Revo by four. They mercy ruled aftermath. They didn't let the Saints put a point up, and then they beat Impact by four at the last event. And that was just the last event. They haven't. They've won. They've lost one game in the prelims in three events. Like that's that's New York Extreme by first degree murder. Like that is just a complete and utter embarrassment from everyone else they're playing it's it's awesome it's cool as a fan to watch but what do they do now you know so okay if they have carl and silos and they're both playing really well and hennessy's there too with how consistent he plays because i'm not going to talk shit on hennessy because that dude he gets it done you know so and then that that d yeah. side is just lights out you know between i mean Corey hall and pat craft and josh taylor and CJ Cantor, like the, all those guys are becoming premier players in their own rights. Yeah. So, and Corey's been having to know. do it every point and, and having a, a guy like Silos over there that can go both ways is um, that might help him out too to catch his breath, you know? So it's, it's one of those, like, he's going to help him. Like there, it's just whether or not those guys stumble here or if they, they rise to the occasion. So. Uh, next question here, Ryan, um, just a couple more before I let you go here. Cause I know we all got kids, but, uh, <laughs> um, AC diesel, you know I mean? So, uh, 12th and 13th, not making any Sundays eighth at the last event. They did lose to heat by three in the quarterfinals. Um, only lost to Legion in the prelims, beat infamous, beat you guys by one, but this is a team you're very familiar with. I mean, you know, a lot of you're a Texan. There's a lot of Texans on that team. You know, every one of the imports. I mean, there's not a lot of more, you know, leading lights that if I have to pick leading lights out of a hat to describe AC Diesel's journey and how you think they're going to do at this next event, you're one of those guys. What do you think? Um, what's their bracket? They got damage hurricanes uh, in front of them. Diesel level, uh, and then uh, and then Saints. Insane. Okay, so and, at the very worst, uh, they'll make it under Sunday as a wild card because they're gonna put a wampin on the Saints, uh, and, and if it goes like it has been so far for level, they're gonna they're gonna beat on them too, right? And I don't, I see them going to be very competitive in both the uh, damage and Hurricanes games. So very worst worst case, I see Diesel playing on Sunday. And once they get to Sunday, they have the talent level to go wherever they, you know, wherever it's going to go. Um, so I, I predict it to be a good, um, good event for them. Uh, they could win their bracket. They could be the wild card team. They could, you know, be the two seed. I, I could see them any of those things happening. They have the talent to do it. Um, I just think no matter what, it's hard to predict out of damage hurricanes and diesel, who's going to be the one seed, the two seed or the three seed. I think all three of those teams are going to make it out because they caught the Saints there. 
Um, if they would if say it would have been the Russians as the five seed, then or really any other team, um, I feel like one of those teams would probably be going home because they're all going to beat each other or they're all going to be very close games. Uh, it's going to be hard to – I don't see any of those teams beating – between damage, hurricanes, and diesel, I see all of those games being tight. Um, so they're not going to be getting great points for us over that win or lose. Um, but yeah, I think. And then once we get to Sunday, uh, you know, between Clint, J. Rab, and Mouse, you have kind of a, a really solid three uh, to kind of base around. And then you just have lots of talent that, you know, Mark Johnson can ball. Uh, he can do a lot more than just cut the check. He can ball. Um, you know, you got Jesse there. Ice can ball. BJ can ball. Um, they, they just they got a lot of players. It's hard. I mean, they got 12 dudes on the roster, right? I think that's their biggest detriment right now. And I think that's the biggest advantage of them having him there. Um, is just someone to say, hey, these guys are going in. You, you want to challenge me on it? Uh, and I think that's probably why they struggled more so the first two events than the last one because they just had a lot of dudes um, and and a lot of trying to figure things out. Um, but then you bring in Mike and just someone to say, all right, these are the guys. And then because it's one of those things, I used to say this about Impact for the longest time when they were carrying 10 or 11 dudes. If they just rolled the dice and say, hey, these five guys are playing this match, um, or this whole tournament, or six, seven guys. You three stay at home because y'all drew the short straws. I think Impact would have won more tournaments. <laughs> but when you have so many moving pieces going on, I think I, I started to touch on this earlier, but we went off on, on another tangent. When you, it's just you go into these team meetings, right? And say you have six guys that are playing, and you got five guys that are for the most part watching the other six guys play, and then they're coming in at relief one or two points a match and some of them aren't touching the field at all and the whole vibe is a little bit different right you've got people in the meeting that maybe aren't paying attention as much as they would be because like why the hell should i be i'm i haven't seen the field in the last four matches i'm not going to see it sunday morning um and it just things get a little bit challenging um and this is just my own personal perspective there's two there's two sides of this coin you could be like us and uh MAO two years ago where we showed up and we only had five healthy guys. Um, so the, you're riding a line, right? But so there's pros and cons of having a deep roster or the trim roster. And there's probably, a, you know, a, an ideal number in between there and it's different for everybody, but there is a problem with having too many guys um, when it comes down to um, you, there's just not enough ball to go around and, and that changes things when you start, you know, stuff. So I think that's diesel's biggest hurdle. Um, but they do have a solid base and um, just a lot of talent. You know, even like people like Horvat and, and Shane, like those guys can play paintball. Nico, like these are good paintball players. They just have a lot of them. They got a shit ton of weapons, man. They really do. Um, yeah. Talking about a team that has a little bit less of an arsenal, but that just made a Sunday after two fifteen places. And then I just, I really like this player. So I just want to bring this into the conversation, get your quick thoughts on it. And then I'll, uh, I have one more team I would like to discuss with you before we'll sign off. Um, but so Elliot Weaver is going to go to Rebo. Now, Elliot Weaver, in my estimation, is one of, you know, because people talk about like, well, this guy's underrated or this guy, you know, this or that guy's underrated. And some of these people that they say they're underrated, I'm like, bro, did you just start watching this last event or five, three events ago? Because if you did, welcome. And I'm happy you're here. But like that guy in my estimation, like is not underrated at all, you know, like a Cody Mikowski or something like that. You know, he was a guy that would be talked yeah. about like that. I'm like, dude, Cody Mikowski won a one-on-one tournament. That dude is, has been, he was like the stud on infamous for years. Like that is, that guy's not, if you're underrated, then if you think that guy's underrated, you're not watching their games. You know, you're watching dynasty and impact and X factor play or whatever. Like you didn't watch an infamous. So when I look at a guy like Elliot Weaver, I mean, it did when we when Energy Elite's been playing for the past couple of seasons, and they have a good point. I mean, I when I'm looking at the guys threading down the field and shooting people, and I'm thinking, and I just keep saying you know, because I, you know, it's a simple equation. I tell people because you know, occasionally guys will come up to me like, "Hey, Matty, say good things about me." I'm like, "Hey, dude, it's a simple equation. If you're shooting everyone, I have to find out what your name is and talk about how awesome you are. And if you're getting shot, same thing there, you know. So it's it, you go shoot everyone, and and 
and I promise you, like, we'll sing your praises. Elliot Weaver has been shooting a ton of people for Energy Elite for a while. And I feel like he's probably one of the most underrated guys in the entire game. And so he's going to go to Rebel now. They lose Silos, and he plays a two, you know, three, situ- you know, kind of a, a spot, you know, a, that second attacker. So I don't know. I, you know, you, you know, if you're a second attacker, you're going to thrive. You need some first attackers to, uh, to do their jobs in order for you to do your job. Um, sometimes you do thrive when your first attacker dies. And that's some of the times we've been mentioning Weaver's name is when his first attacker does die. And then he goes off and shoots three dudes. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, that was another amazing point by Elliot Weaver. Um, just want to know if Weaver's on your radar and what you think about this move and how it affects Revo. Um, yeah, Weaver's just kind of always been on my radar as just a real solid piece of whether it was on Boom or it was over here on NRG, that she was just a, a solid player that doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He's a good gunfighter and um, he handles pressure well. Um, so, you know, he, I, to my understanding, he walked from NRG soon after the event and, yes. you know, was yeah. weighing his options. Um, and I believe Coach Jansen, walked as well um and they yes. both came over from boom um so that's kind of a little exodus there uh and both revo and energy are both two teams that i believe they're both in our bracket the next tournament and they're just been both underperforming to their talent level especially and if you look at years past you know these are teams that um are really struggling this season and they're doing a fair amount of roster roulette to try to get themselves um back where they need to be um so who's gonna went out on that and click you know that, that'll be the question here um but it's uh and, and they both they're kind of a, in a similar position where it's, it's us impact and them in a bracket um so it's gonna be they're both looking at um because of their prior underperforming um a tough bracket and they're like we got to figure this out and so they're both making moves. Um, I think Revo losing Silos and getting uh, Weaver, um, you're looking at typical like skill level players, but just play very different positions. Uh, and I'm just wondering where Weaver goes on Revo. Who does he play over and, and where? Or does he just add more depth? Um, because if, say, they didn't have Velez back, then I think then that's his spot right there. But Revo got Velez back before the last tournament. And say Henry was still hurt, then there's a spot. But to my understanding, uh, Henry is not only healthy, but he's lost like 30 pounds of fat and added 15 pounds of muscle. I don't even see him, Henry, but he looks shredded. Looks like a completely good different for, human. Good for you. Um, good for yeah. you, Henry. Way to, yeah. way to take your weakness and make it into your times. strength. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, how do you do this when you're injured? It's really interesting. Um, hopefully, we get a, a Sada or something in here and get, get Henry off the field. But <laughs> um, he, 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 so, but uh, hey, dude, I was so, yeah, I was so, a big I, fan of the steroid era of baseball. So you know, whatever, just let, yeah. just let it rock. You know yeah, what I mean? let, let it rock. But yeah, I've never thought Henry Sense would be like, yeah, we're worried about juicing, but now we are. Um, here we go. <laughs> um, so, um, but anyways, you know, so I'm I'm looking at you know where we were fits. Uh, very capable player, uh, talented player. I just where does he fit over there? I'm not sure. Um, and then, you know, energy, they lose Weaver, uh, they replace him with Devin Stewart. Um, and I think, um, that might work well for them. Uh, it's a good, you know, they couldn't, they didn't get, you know, Weaver was gone. Right. Um, but I think it's a good player to slot in there because, um, you know, Devin has experience of at least being around. He's won, he's been around champions and whether or not he's been on the one on the field, winning or being that guy that's that's really um you know standing out and, and to gain those wins but he's been getting more reps over the past year or two um but he knows how to what it takes right he's seen it so how much of that he's absorbed from heat and how much he's well you know able to take that and teach uh and around the people around him that's to to you know to be seen um but it might be a really good pickup for energy you know, to, if he's able to instill a little bit of that upon them and, and they can level up um because if not you know they're, they're they've kind of been stuck 
doing what they've been doing. You know, it's like they, they gain a player, they lose a player. You know, they, they lose uh, Abel, they pick up Chewy. You know, they lose Weaver, they pick up Devin. And it's just, they're, it's not like they're gaining a lot of talent or losing a lot of talent as far as like where their level is at. Uh, they're just kind of maintaining. So maybe, maybe this will work out for them. Yeah, again, it's just it's a, it is a bit of a magical mystery of how the crazy sauce of a pro paintball team kind of comes together. It's not, it's not science. It's not two and two is four. It's not you know uh, an equation. Um, it is a, a lot of kind of art, artistic interpretation from personalities in a lot of ways. But you do have to have certain contingencies taken care of. You have to have ones. You have to have twos and threes. They do have those guys. It's just, can they step up? Are they going to vibe together? Um, you know, Devin is also an interesting story too. But, you know, again, you and I could sit here and talk for hour, you know, hours as we have about this. But the last question I have for you is, uh, which I think, again, you know, when we're talking about these stories heading into Chicago, uh, 15th through the 17th of, uh, of September, coming up here in, you know, three weeks, the hurricanes have just been in- incredibly impre- impressive, man. Like, like the New England, sorry the new orleans hurricanes if that's if you want an inspiring squad to follow like that's your squad because it's a bunch of dudes that like they have no higher guns these are all blue collar ballers that have regular jobs that love the game and have slowly but surely got elite at it and they have made every single sunday seventh seventh and a sixth uh undefeated at the at, in the last prelims they beat the breaks off the ironman mercy rule win there beat notorious by two um beat the ml kings by three beat heat by one and then lose to damage by two what are your thoughts on the hurricanes ryan you're you you know you when you look at the the way that x factor came up back in the day different story but it was uh you know it it was kind of an unknown team you know like we didn't know that x factor was as good as they were when they got to the pro leagues we looked at you guys like oh who who the hell are these kids and then you guys earned our respect because you deserved it. The Hurricanes have done that. They've earned everyone's respect. What are your thoughts on the Hurricanes? Um, just a really solid organization that has a game plan and they ex- execute it with extreme discipline. Um, and I think that's just really stems from Coach Bianca. And I believe he has a military background. And that's probably where uh, some of this structure and discipline and, and, and they just implement it. You know, and that's um, that's getting them, you know, where they are, which is extremely impressive. You just you don't see it. You know, it's like, a, you know, us on X Factor, I think it's a little bit different as far as like it was different times back then. You know, like we we kind of came in with our style of a bunch of young kids just kind of running around crazy. And we had a lot of success in semi pro. And, um, you know, maybe I think we were a little too young and dumb eve to to be intimidated um and and realize what we were doing was kind of against the odds and and the league was younger at that point too and and maybe there was a little bit less parity um but right now we're in this league that has a ton of parity a lot of these teams are established plenty of teams have come up from semi-pro and fallen right on their face um the hurricanes they didn't win a ton in semi-pro they were just consistent um, and maybe they got one win or uh, I'm not really sure. I don't want to speak too much on that, but I, I, I don't believe they were just winning a bunch of summer pro tournaments. Um, and it was kind of a similar thing that they were implementing, um, this kind of solid consistency and it's allowed them to level up and, um, hang in big matches and, and take a lot of teams down to the wire. I feel like they're just missing a, a, a little bit more. Um, and to be frank, I don't really want them to find it. Um, because they're just, <laughs> they're, they're, they're good, man. It's just uh, straight up, you know, what, what they go out there and they try to do, they do really well. And so when we've only played them once and we were able to get an early lead and the match was, um, you know, in our control the entire time, but I think it really came, you know, down to us making them uncomfortable, um, you know, early, but. I think when they get up on teams or they get in these games, these long drawn out points, like their players have a lot of discipline. They don't make a lot of errors and they, they know it's too. So it's impressive. Yeah. I mean, the hurricanes is again, just such an inspiring story. Cause as the Gulf 
Coast Hurricanes before they were the New Orleans Hurricanes. Um, you know, they came out of D4 in, in 2019, decided to you know, have their, you know, big moment, go all the way to semi-pro, uh, and then ended up, you know, getting the victory in 2020 at the World Cup in semi-pro. So, and that was, I feel, kind of like the big confidence booster for them. And then they went pro. And I remember talking to him and I'm like, dude, there's look, I, and I've heard this story so many times because every, you know, everyone says the same thing. Oh, we're going to play our game and, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to do this Maddie. And, and I'm, you know, most of the time it never works. Sometimes it does. So anytime I hear that, I'm like, Hey man, best of luck to you. You know, I hope it does work for you. You know, I don't, don't mean to be, you know, patronizing about it, but I've just been here for 30 years. So I've seen this a lot. And then sure enough, dude, they just roll into the pro league and immediately start to become relevant. You know, it was like 15th and then, a, and then a sixth, a 13th and a fifth, 14th, and then seven, seven, six, you know? So it's like, they're there, you know, they're, they're there and they're relevant and they've gone uh, through these prelims where they just go undefeated and look really good and beating good teams. And it's just, uh, it's incredibly impressive and inspiring. So this is, again, if you're somebody that wants to ruin on an underdog, this is one of those squads and it's really fun to watch. Um, you know, are, are they ready to win a tournament yet? Well, that's up to them, you know, prove it to us. And I always say that to all these people. It's like, Oh, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Uh, okay, cool. That's awesome. Everyone's doing that. So prove it to us. Let me see it. Like, do you actually have that in your soul? Is that in your constitution? Is that in your skills? Do you have that at your talent level? Like, are you actually taking your talent level to a place that it's being fulfilled? Because that is, these are all different things. And so it, it's kind of fun to see them get to this level. And I, and I really, and I, you know, again, with some of these teams that are kind of floating, like you said, there is a lot of parity in the league. And last couple seasons we've seen parody we've never seen before this might be my last question i'm just wondering do you think we are seeing the parody this year that we've seen the past couple seasons do you think it slipped a little bit or do you think it's the same and then i'll let you go after this i think the the only reason i feel like it's slipped a little bit is that we're seeing some franchises that are good underperform and so they care have proven to be good taking a step back and so uh, teams like uh, level, it's just the like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. The Ironman level, you know, but you know, like you look at last year, it's like the Ironman were bad. They had one really good event at a, at a minor. Um, and I think going into this year, I think they're still a talented, bad team that can turn it, turn it on at any moment. But that, that's kind of what's defined them for a little bit. You know, they just haven't a lot of, they're still trying to figure it out. But Level was a, a pretty consistent, good team. And, you know, they parted ways with their coach and they lost Silberg and maybe another player got injured, I believe. But, like, they're just, they, they look a mess. Uh, but that they're good paintball players. So they, I feel like they could step up at any time. Um, and I think that's kind of where my head, the parity does lie that teams like Energy and Revo uh, and Level and these teams that, where we're making Sundays last year um, and making this kind of real parody. Those are now the teams that are struggling that I feel like at any minute could, could stumble into a quarterfinals game, if not a semifinals game. So when I look down the list of 20 teams, um, I see a lot of parody because a lot of games are scary. It's no longer, you know, back in the day when, when you played and, you know, even, you know, towards the end of your career when I was playing too, like you would look and you're like, all right, these are our four games. We're hundred percent winning these two. And then these two, we need to show up for. And it was like that every tournament, like that's how separated it was. If you were a team that was a, a team that had, you know, the ability to win tournaments, like it was, it was split down the middle. There were Sunday teams and there were the teams that didn't really stand a chance to make it to Sunday. And it was like that for a long time. And now it's like, there's Sunday teams and there's the saints. And, and that, that to me, that's kind of what it is. Like I look at the other 19 teams and I couldn't make a case that I wouldn't be willing to bet 
a, a large amount of money that they won't make Sunday in Chicago brackets to paint. Um, and maybe yeah. the Saints can pull it off too because I've seen them get close to winning games and just blow it. But Bro, right I now, that's what the parents right. discuss. I, could, I, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. Let's just, I mean, <laughs> to, and to add evidence to that, let's just look at the, uh, so you have the Saints at 20th. The next three teams, 1918, 17th place is Legion Ironman Uprising. Are you, I mean, yeah, dude, like you're telling me that Legion can't show up and make a Sunday at Chicago. Yeah, that's definitely possible. You, you I don't couldn't know argue with me that Legion can't show up and win Chicago if they can make it. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot yeah, of guys. Yeah, exactly. Is around. that, is yeah. that worth a bet? Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, like yeah. what's the odds going to be? I don't know. I don't know. We Cause it's been so hard for them to get their starting line over with the war and everything, all this crazy stuff that's gone down. So, you know, yeah, it's been really hard for them to get their starting line over if, if, and they had four of their starting uh, five over for a while, but yeah, dude, like you said, in some universe, if they had four of their starting five, whoever the fifth is, if those dudes have some cardio going, like, yeah, that team's going to go deep on Sunday. And then Ironman and uprising. Well, the Ironman won, or sorry, didn't win, but they, well, they won Vegas in 20, 2020 and uh, obviously a different team, um, but they've proven to be highly competitive, changing the roster up constantly. It's the longest running pro team in existence with, you know, Shane Pestana, Mike Paxton and Nikki, you know, leading the charge over there. So yeah, yeah, that would they have a hell of a coaching shocking. staff. So they have a hell of a coaching staff. I just imagine that they're, they're not far off from figuring out the right bodies that need to be on the field. And I think, and I think it's a little bit of a, they took on a little bit too much and they're, and they're filtering and you see each tournament, they seem like they have one or two less guys. I feel like they're, they're going to whittle it down, but that's a team that can play on Sunday. Like no problem. I think unfortunately, as the season goes, it becomes harder and harder to make Sunday. Um, once you're kind of stuck in that fifth tier, then you got a long or a big mountain to climb. Um, so I think that's their, their biggest issue is going to be that. Yeah, and then your your bracket with so it's X Factor, Impact, Revo, Energy, Elite, and Ironman. I mean that that might be the bracket of death. Ryan, thank you so much for for uh, sitting down with me. Uh, the last, just real quick, last thing project. Uh, you guys just had a drop for anyone that's stuck with us. I got here, one. Uh, that wants, yeah. What do you got, dude? I because you guys keep releasing oh. all this cool stuff. Oh, and this is a big one. So this is the uh, the Project G two here. Um, so this is on the uh, LB2 platform, G2. Um, so we're, we're kind of ripping through these. Uh, we made 200. Um, and there's, uh, I think we've done two drops so far of 30 markers. They both sold out really quickly. Um, and so uh, we might release some more next week. Dealing with, uh, your, your, uh, I was on the phone with FedEx all day. So dealing with shipping, making sure we're processing. I don't really love the idea of holding people's money for a long amount of time with these pre-sales. Um, so one of those things, but yeah, we'll probably do another drop next week, but uh, if you want one, come get one. Yeah. You, on our Instagram, it's <laughs> where you probably find all the information. Yeah. And then, um, and you guys have been doing your own anodizing now, which I know can be a son of a bitch, but you guys have decided to wade into the anodizing game, which I think is really cool. Cause both you and Archie are really good at things that you decide to do. Um, but I know that that is a very interesting road um but also a very kind of cool thing too because it does give a, a certain artistic and like expression to the people creating these things because the anodizing is a big part of the finished product yeah definitely um yes we started technique anodizing and it's a, a humbling process we've been kind of uh nose to the grindstone probably been learning for about 10 months i think over the past three months we've been kind of five days a week, really, really kind of going at it. And, uh, it is a humbling process, uh, probably half art, half science, um, big respect to, uh, all the other companies that have been doing it and some of the amazing work they're doing. Um, we're finally getting to the part where we're, uh, putting out some, uh, you know, work we're really proud of. I think probably if anyone saw the gun, all over was shooting at the last event. Um, I think we got a lot of attention on that gun we did. Um, and, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. It's kind of a, a nice next level of passion that, that me and Archie have been taking on. And, um, so yeah, it's fun. Uh, but we got, a 
uh, it's uh, another journey, you know, it's uh, another learning process. It's like in paintball where you either win or you learn, uh, same thing in business. And I would say, uh, we've been doing a whole lot of learning for the past few months. Um, uh, but we're <laughs> That's getting there. So cool, no, it's cool. I mean, there's just such a huge backlog with all the anodizers, you know, I mean, whether it's aesthetic or outlaw or, I mean, you know, it's like everyone that does out anodizing just he's like you talk to him it's like uh yeah dude like three months from now i think i can get you in so you know like the fact you guys decided to do your own anodizing which having worked at die and known tons of anodizers over time like it, it that's it's hard it's it's not the easiest thing in the world it's not like you said it's half art and half science so i think that's really cool that you guys are doing your own anodizing it does add like a special thing to you know the project drops it's not like you know because yeah. actually if that's going to be your thing like you then all the project drops will have been anodized by you so it's designed by you cut anodized and then it just it kind of adds like a chain of custody through the artistic process to create the fine final marker or you know regulator or like whatever it may be um and then again as somebody that's worked in a lot of warehouses for for, for paintball stuff i think that's noble cause that you guys have decided to do and i think it's really cool um but i know how much of a son of a bitch that could be so god bless you dude like that's it's, yeah I've chosen a different here's the here is the paths let's choose the most difficult path we'll do our own advertising <laughs> yeah it's you know it's funny too because like we we went down that path because of the backlog and we were doing some custom runs of our markers and we'd sent it off to a couple of the other you know elite anodizers and you know, we had to wait three months or so. And, you know, I think at the time I was in my head, like, what the hell is taking them so long? Um, we just, we can't have this bottleneck. Um, and now I know what was taking them so long. It's hard. Um, so that's uh, one of those things, but we're, we're trying to alleviate that uh, bottleneck. And, um, you know, and I think we've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of people have been happy with some of the stuff we've been putting out. And so maybe we'll start taking on some customer guns um, outside of project here um you know in the near future um but it's uh it's been fun it's it's nice to be able to um one um have to learn a new skill and be challenged and have to figure stuff out um and two um just to kind of be able to you know me and archie i think we both in have a similar um like of, of how certain things look and a style to stuff um and i think we're haven't really seen some of it so much uh, of of what some of the animators are doing while they're doing amazing beautiful work um there's just some other stuff we'd like to do and bring to the table ourselves and not that they couldn't do it but i think they've focused um elsewhere and doing some other kind of crazy over the top things uh and i think a little bit's loss of what's just really cool and beautiful so that's what we're trying to kind of make up and that's the art we're trying to kind of bring to life on some of these paintball guns hell yeah love that well thank you so much for sitting in with me bro i can't wait to see what you and x factor do at this next event again it is going down september 15th through the 17th and we're creeping up on it and we're gonna see the layout here pretty soon we're gonna have a ton of shows coming at you here from ghost sports to build a narrative and discuss all this crazy stuff that's going to be going down but uh yeah ryan we are expecting big things from you guys any last thoughts before we sign off um no i think uh you know as always kind of thank you to alex martinez without him uh just there is no x factor it's just as as you know plain as that is and, and honestly i don't even think there's a lot of other amazing texas stories and, and paintball things that have come up over the past 10 years but when alex was doing it there just wasn't and how much of that you know rolled downhill from what he did um you know there's an argument to be made um so i think he's people call him the godfather in texas paintball for a reason um you know a lot of other people have started to kind of pick up that torch and which is amazing because that's what he wanted all along so thanks to alex um and, and thanks to you and uh everyone that's supporting us and uh and x factor and uh, we're gonna get the next one that's all i'm gonna say can't wait to see it thank you guys so much for tuning in i'll see you guys on the next show again we're gonna have uh be having a bunch of shows coming at you here heading up to the next event which is the windy city major again going down september 15th through the 17th Ryan Brand, thank you so much. Good luck to X Factor at the next one. We'll see you guys soon.